Brothers and sisters, welcome this afternoon. On behalf of the Consistia, I have the following announcements. You are reminded of the congregational meeting tomorrow evening in Drong at 7.45 p.m. Next week, Sunday, we will, the Lord willing, celebrate the Lord's Supper. Due to the periodic retirement of elders W. Amaral, M. Retief and J. Reistenberg and Deacons D. Bail and D. Visser, nominations for men suitable for the office of elder and deacon are requested. New nomination needs to be substantiated, substantiated and signed and received by the Secretary by no later than Sunday, 18 September. Brother Bruce Scoof and Sister Sally Gunning have indicated their intention to enter into the married state according to the ordinance of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and complete it to his glory. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the ceremony will take place, Lord willing, on Saturday, 2nd October at 10.30 a.m. in the Armadale Church building, Reverend Salmon officiating. Also, Brother Travis Maring and Sister Laura de Snoo have indicated their intention to enter into the married state according to the ordinance of God. They desire to begin this state in the name of the Lord and to complete it to his glory. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the ceremony will take place, the Lord willing, 11 a.m. on Friday, 15th October, in Daring Downs Church Building, with Reverend Vermeuling officiating. The stations have been requested by Brother Bruce Scoof to the Freer from Church of Kelmscott, and Sister Esther Pluck to the Freer from Church of Rockingham, and Sister Laura de Snoo to the Freer from Church of Mundijong. Brothers and sisters, this afternoon's call to worship is taken from Psalm 22, verse 25. My praise shall be of you in a great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. Brothers and sisters, now please rise for our votum and salutation. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. And a ruler over the king, kings of the earth. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us now sing in response to the greeting of the Lord from Psalm 27. God is my light, my refuge, my salvation. Psalm 27, let us sing the verses 1 and 2.
brothers and sisters, this afternoon, now that, that we have come together as the Church of Christ here in Armadale, we will, together with the Church of all times and all places, profess our undoubted Catholic Christian faith. We do it with the word of the Apostles' Creed. And let everyone confess with me in his heart the following. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us now sing together and praise this triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the words of Him. For we praise you, God the Father, the Creator, Him. For let us sing all three verses. Let us now pray. Our Father in heaven, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune God, we humble ourselves before you, before your holy throne. Father, it is your love in which you come to us, in which you gave your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to suffer and to die for our sins, so that now we may stand in righteousness before you. And it is the work of your Holy Spirit through whom we have faith, that we may believe this wonderful gospel, that we may embrace it and live in it. It is through him, your Spirit, that we receive new life. Father, we pray, will you work in our hearts so that we may enjoy that life and live in the joy of faith, in the knowledge that we are righteous before you and that nothing can separate us from you and from your love. 
Father, give us then that we are steadfast, going in your ways, living with you, walking with you all the days of our lives. And be also with us this afternoon, that now that we have come together again as your people. We've come together to listen to you, to the preaching of your word, and to respond to that in our worship. Father, we bless us then. Bless the preaching, bless us in listening. Fill us, our hearts, our mouths, with songs of thanksgiving and praise. Hear us and see us while we are here together as your people that all may be to the praise and the glory of your name. Father, this we pray in the name of your Son, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us now read from the prophecy of Habakkuk, starting in chapter 1, verse 1, and we read through to chapter 2, verse 4. And there we read that while well, all around us we may see God's punishment going over this world, we may know that the righteous shall live by faith, by his faith. But that is also what I proclaim to you this afternoon as the doctrine is summarized by the church in Lord's Day 23 of the Heidelberg Catechism. So let us now read from Habakkuk 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 4. Now we read the word of God. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Look among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence, their faces are set like the east wind, they gather captives like sand, they scoff at, th at kings and princes are scorned by them, they deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes and he transgresses, he commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in a net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to the net and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets 
that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the, at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Brothers and sisters, the just shall live by his faith. Blessed is the man who may stand in righteousness before God, whose trespass is forgiven, as also David prophesied in Psalm 32. Let us now sing from Psalm 32, the verses 1, 2, and 3.
Brothers and sisters, let us now read Lord's Day 23 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 23, that's the Lord's Day, the first Lord's Day in our, uh, it's part about our justification. In Lord's Day 23, there we read the Confession of the Church, what the Church summarized from God's Word. Lord's Day 23 follows after the explanation of the Apostles' Creed, and now it continues about that. Question 59, but what does it help you now that you believe all this? In Christ I am righteous before God, an heir to life everlasting. How are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all God's commandments, I have never kept any of them, and am still inclined to all evil. Yet God, without any merit of my own, out of mere grace, imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. He grants these to me as if I had never had nor committed any sin, and as if I myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ has rendered for me. If only I accept this gift with a believing heart. Why do you say that you are righteous only by faith? Not that I am acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith. For only the satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God. I can receive this righteousness and make it my own by faith only. Brothers and sisters, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord's Day 23 and also Lord's Day 24 speak about our justification. We are justified by faith only. And that's one of those important moments in a confession in the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism explained in Lord's Day 7 that it is only by faith that we are saved. Only those are grafted into Christ. They receive all his benefits. And then from Lord's Day 9 to 22, the Apostles' Creed is being explained. What do we believe? All that is summarized in the 12 articles of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. And now the Heidelberg Catechism returns again to one of those main points of the doctrine which are so important that it has to be repeated time and again. I am righteous only by faith. And that is what the Reformation rediscovered from God's Word. And that is what Satan time and again tries to cover up. And that is what we have to remind each other of. And that is what is being preached time and again. We are justified only by faith in Jesus Christ. Only by faith. The word only sometimes tries to minimize things. But in this case, it is something so wonderful that we are justified by faith. Not by anything of ourselves, but by faith. There is something we can hold fast to outside of ourselves. In this world in which so much is happening, in this world in which so many people are desperate and desperately looking for something that gives them certainty, in this world in which nothing is certain, there we have certainty, not in ourselves, outside of ourselves, in God by faith. The righteous shall live 
and by his faith. That's what God revealed to his people already in the Old Testament. The Israelites, they entered Canaan after Moses and Joshua. But in Canaan, they didn't do well. They continued in their unbelief. They followed other gods. They sinned against God's commandments. And God punished them time and again. And in the end, after many godless kings, after the kingdom was split in two, the ten tribes and the two tribes, and also the two tribes, they went astray from the Lord, then God had to punish them with the Babylonian exile. And Habakkuk saw it all happening. He saw how Israel, how Judah was godless, and and there was no righteousness among God's people. They all went on their own ways. The poor were neglected, were oppressed even, and the rich people got richer and richer, and they didn't care about the needy. And God, in his wrath over his people, punished them. And that is what we see in Habakkuk 1. First, he spoke about violence, violence among God's own people. And then God responded to him in verse 5, Look around the nations and watch. I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. God called the Chaldeans, and they came to punish the Jews, Judah. But they were terrible and dreadful. But then in verse 11, then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. So there again we see that God uses the Chaldeans to punish his people, but then the Chaldeans become pride. Pride is the worst, they become proud, and pride is the worst sin that you can commit because pride makes you stand up against God. It makes you deny God. The Chaldeans did not realize that they were tools in the hands of God. So God said, now I will punish the Chaldeans. After I first used them to punish my people, now I will punish them because of their pride. And then Habakkuk cries out, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. And then the Lord answered Habakkuk, God will punish all those who are unrighteous, whether they are God's people or the enemies. All those who are unrighteous, they will be judged. It will surely come. It will not tarry. The proud, his soul is not upright in him. The Chaldeans, they became proud, and they will be punished for that. But the just shall live by his faith. Among all those prophecies about punishment, about God's wrath, we see this beautiful sentence, the just shall live by his faith. And that is what is quoted by Paul in Romans 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. And that is what Luther discovered, the just shall live by faith in a world also in which he saw a lot of misery and and God's punishment coming over Europe with all the threats from outside and inside. The just shall live by faith. And that was a revelation for him and that was a revelation for many people in those days who discovered that this is the certainty which we have in our life. This is it what gives us joy. The just shall live by his faith. If I believe, then I may know I am righteous. Believe it. I am righteous. You are righteous. Believe it. And that is where they found joy, in a world filled with uncertainty. In a world in which you couldn't trust governments, in a world in which the enemies from outside were coming up, getting stronger. There's not much different in our world. It's very much like the time of Luther and the Reformation. It's always the same in the world. So much uncertainty, so much sin, so much unrighteousness. In that world, God says to us, the righteous shall live by his faith. Believe in Jesus Christ and you are righteous. Not because of your own works, not because of anything in yourself, but because of Jesus Christ, in Christ, despite my conscience, only by faith. And that's the gospel I may proclaim to you here this afternoon. The gospel that comes to us and is summarized by the church in Lossy 23. And I proclaim it to you under this theme. 
I am righteous. In the first place, in Christ. In the second place, despite my conscience. In the third place, by faith. I am righteous. In the first place, in Christ. This doctrine of righteousness by faith only, that is completely central in our faith. If you don't believe this, if, if you don't believe this with all our heart, then we can just as well give up the whole Bible. There is no self-righteousness. There is nothing that we can do to make us stand before God in righteousness. There is nothing that we have to offer to God when we come before God. It's all sin. But then we hear that we are being declared righteous. God says, you are righteous, not in ourselves, but in Christ. It is by Christ and in Christ that we can hear from God the declaration, you are righteous. Do you believe it? Can you believe your ears when you're standing there before God and God says to you, well, you know that all your sins. You know all your sins. You know all that you did wrong. And then God says, you are righteous because Christ paid for you. Can you believe it? Well, that is faith. Believe it because it is true. If God says so, then it is so. The only one who never lies, who always speaks the truth, he declares you righteous, then you are righteous. Believe it by faith in Christ. If God forgives you your sins, then your sins are forgiven. How blessed is the man whose trespass is forgiven, David said in Psalm 32. And the whole Bible speaks about it. The only one who can forgive sins is God. But if God does forgive your sins, then they are forgiven. And God made this forgiveness possible through his Son, Jesus Christ. And that is what we read throughout the Gospels. When the Lord Jesus was on earth and they brought the sick and the lame to them, then he forgave them their sins. Remember that story of the paralytic who was brought by his four friends and they let him down through the roof. And the Lord saw their faith and he said to this man, Son, child, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees and, and, and the teachers of the law, they said, he is blaspheming because no one can forgive sins except only God. Well, that was exactly it, what the Lord Jesus wanted to make clear to them. He was God. He is God. He is the one who came to forgive sins and they should believe him instead of rejecting him. God came to forgive sins in his son, Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus Christ came to this earth. And if he... Read about our Lord Jesus Christ. He came to this earth so that God can forgive our sins. He came to suffer and to die on the cross, to suffer eternal death. And if we remember how terrible his suffering was, that shows to us that this forgiveness that we receive from God is not superficial. It has an enormous depth. And therefore, more and more, we will know our sin and misery first part of the catechism, was it 2 to 4. How do you know your sin and misery? From the law of God. And what does God teach us in his law? You shall love the Lord, Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we able to keep all this perfectly? No, I am by nature inclined to hate God and my neighbor. And that is our sin and misery, to hate God and a neighbor. By putting myself in the first place, by believing that I am most important, by believing it's all about me in this life, we hate God and our neighbor. That is our sin and misery. And even though we put ourselves in the first place, we can't offer anything to God for our salvation. But then God comes to us and says, I, I sent my son. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that all those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. God showed his love by giving up his only son, the one whom he loved. Loved above everything and everyone else. And the son came and gave himself up and suffered and died for our sins. 
That is God's love. In his love, he saved us and forgives us our sins. And then we should not take it lightly because the death of God's Son was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. We can so easily say sorry. And then we think it's all forgiven. If you offend someone, say sorry. Sometimes you don't even mean it. And then you think, well, I've said sorry, so you must forgive me. Think about what it cost God to be able to forgive us. And that shows us our sin and misery. Sin is no joking matter. Don't take sin lightly. Don't believe that it is so easy to ask for forgiveness. Just one sentence in your prayer, we pray this in the forgiveness of all our sins. Well, no, that's not how it is. The forgiveness, the forgiveness of all our sins that comes when we know our sin and misery and confess our sin and misery before God. And then God says, yes, but don't worry, I have forgiven you all your sins because I love you. And now God says, believe it. Believe it. Receive it in faith. And then God declares us righteous. Again, when we are standing before God, God says, you are righteous in Christ. And this declaration is based on the truth. And whenever God says something, it is true. Whenever God says that we are righteous, that means that, that, that means that all the requirements for this declaration have been met. When you graduate from, from, from high school, or when you get a diploma, or when you follow a course, and it all goes well, you get a certificate that declares that you have met all the requirements of the course. And that you're capable of doing what is required of you. Well, when God gives us the declaration of the forgiveness of sins, then it means that all the requirements have been met fully. Not to 50% or, or higher, but to the full 100%, because that was the requirement that all sins should be paid for. All sins, to the last little one, should be covered. And that is what Christ did. He forgives us all our sins. All the requirements are met. And then God declares us righteous. Now we are righteous. God does not do as if. It is not that God knows that we are sinful, but God says, well, let's forget about it. No. For God, it is true now that we are righteous. Why? Because Christ took away all our sins. And when all our sins are taken away, then God sees us there as righteous, having met all his requirements. But how is that possible? We learn from the Bible that all the requirements of God's law have to be met in order to be declared righteous. And even our best works are tainted with sin. And we are unable to keep God's law perfectly, Lord said too. We are a total failure. It is not that our marks just fell a bit short, just under 50%. No, we are a total failure, totally unable to do any good and inclined to all evil. And the Bible tells us righteousness is only through the law. But the law condemns us. Paul explains in Romans 2 and 3. But then in Romans 3, verse 21, Paul says righteousness becomes clear apart from the law. God gives righteousness apart from the law. That means, yes, still God's law is being fulfilled, but not by me. I cannot fulfill God's law. But then Christ comes and fulfills all the requirements of God's law. He fulfilled the complete righteousness of the law. And that is how I am righteous. So still all the requirements are being met but in Christ. And now that all the requirements of the law have been fulfilled, now God comes to us and said, yes, you have fulfilled all the requirements. I declare you righteous. And that is true and certain. 
God declares us righteous. And if God declares us righteous, there is no reason to doubt but believe. I am righteous in Christ. And in the second place, despite my conscience. This declaration from God is enormously important. It's a matter of eternal life and death. If we have this declaration from God, then we have life. If you don't have this declaration from God, if God does not declare us righteous, then there is no life for us. And there's no way to escape that conclusion. In Habakkuk 1 and 2, we read about punishment, about despair. The whole world around Habakkuk was despairing. But then Habakkuk got a promise, the righteous shall live by his faith. There is no need to despair for those who are righteous. There is no need to fear. Whatever happens in this world, we know it is all from God. There is no need to fear because God declares us righteous. And if we are righteous, we live under God's protection. If God's declaration is negative, if we are not being declared righteous, then that means eternal death. If it is positive, it means eternal life. And nobody can change it. No human being, no angel, no devil can change that. Denying that God doesn't exist does not help. There are so many people on this earth who think that, well, yeah, they don't need to believe in God because in the past they needed God to explain so many things, but now we have science and science can explain everything so we don't need God anymore. And if you don't need God anymore, then God doesn't exist anymore. And if God doesn't exist anymore, I don't need to fear. I can do whatever I want and nothing will happen when I die. Then we stop to exist and return to the dust. But they can tell themselves thousands of times that that is what is true, but it is not true. Denying that God exists does not make it true. God does exist. Even though the whole world may deny that God exists, God still exists. And God still is righteous. And if God still declares you righteous, then you are righteous. And God does not declare you righteous, then you are not righteous. And an eternal punishment will follow. So many in this world have become proud, like the Chaldeans in Habakkuk 1, verse 11, like the Pharaoh in Egypt, like so many throughout the history who stood up against God and became proud and, and made themselves God. So also now a lot of people make themselves God, declaring that God doesn't exist, but their declaration is worthless and cannot save them from God's eternal wrath. The only one who can save them is Jesus Christ. But those who do believe that God exists, and those who do believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins, they are righteous. And no human being, despite all their threats and all their power, can take that away from us, brothers and sisters. If you believe that you are righteous before God, don't fear the threats of human beings. Don't fear the threats of governments or of devils. Believe that you are righteous and nothing shall separate you from the love of God. But then even from time to time our conscience can testify against us. So often we doubt. Is it really true? If you look at ourselves, if you look at this world, is it really true? How is it possible that I am righteous? If I look at my, my, my life, oh yeah, I'm pretty good, I do this, I do that, and if other people look at me, they, well, they can see someone who is pretty good. But if I look deep in my heart, I know that it is not good. I know that I fail in so many things. My conscience accuses me, even though people may praise me. My conscience accuses me. And my conscience looks at the law, the law of God. And my conscience knows that my life is not okay. But then God says to us, it is as if I never had or committed any sin. Verse 23 says that, Christian answer 60. He grants these to me as if I never had nor committed any sin. And that is what God reveals to us in his word. 
although your conscience accuses you. For God, it is as if you never had nor committed any sin. Think about it. Remember that phrase every day of your life. And be thankful and rejoice. For God, it is as if I never had nor committed any sin at this very moment. And that is true. I am righteous now and here. Not in the future, but now. Now and forever. Therefore, we don't need to fear Judgment Day, but we look forward to it. Our sins have been done away with. God has removed them as far as the east is removed from the west. And next week, in the Lord's Supper form, we will hear it again. So far, God has removed our transgressions from us, as high as the heavens are above the earth, and as far as the east is removed from the west. Here and now, we are righteous. God declares us righteous. And we are righteous every time we receive this declaration in true faith. We may know that we are righteous. And now we live with God, here and now, in holiness. Lord say 14 already said it. Lord say 14, question answer 36. What benefit do you receive from the holy conception and birth of Christ? He is our mediator and with his innocence and perfect holiness covers in the sight of God my sin in which I was conceived and born. Even that very beginning, my original sin, my sinful inclination is covered by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He was conceived and born in righteousness so that he can cover our entire life from conception to death. We are completely righteous here and now, covered by Christ's righteousness. And that's the new reality, reality in which we live. The new reality which we receive by faith, here and now. Satan is thrown down. Revelation 12, the great red dragon war came in heaven after Jesus Christ ascended. War came in heaven Satan was thrown down and he tried to get back into heaven but Michael and his angels fought against him and he was not able to come back in heaven. Satan is not allowed to come in heaven anymore and he was the accuser of our brothers and sisters in the Old Testament. He was the accuser of all those who lived before the ascension of Jesus Christ. But now he cannot come in heaven anymore. And now all those who believe in Jesus Christ before or after his ascension are declared righteous by God and there is no accuser standing there to tell them that it is not true. It is God who says so and Jesus Christ is seated at his right hand, our advocate, but the accuser is thrown down from heaven, has no right to speak anymore. But if God does not declare us righteous, then Christ is sitting there at his right hand as the accuser the accuser of all those who rejected him. But by faith, united with Jesus Christ, we do not need to fear the day of judgment it's because God declares us righteous and Christ seated at his right hand. He, will, he is our advocate. He is not our accuser. At this moment, by faith, we are righteous and nothing more is required from us. God grants these to me as if I had never had nor committed any sin. God gives it to me, a grant. We don't need to do anything for it. We receive it by faith. Nevertheless, it's often so hard to believe. Faith is so simple, so easy, but at the same time so difficult. It's so hard to believe that it is true, but it is true. It brings us to our third point. It is by faith that I am righteous. If only I accept this gift with a believing heart. Answer 60 says, Christ came to save the entire mankind. Christ sent his apostles to all nations. They had to make disciples of all nations. They had to preach this gospel of salvation to this entire creation. And God's Grace, salvation through Jesus Christ was offered to all, to all those who live on this earth. But not all believe it. Not all accept it. It is only by faith that we receive it. 
God offers it to us. Christ gives it to us. But only by faith we receive it. If you don't believe, then we refuse it. Unbelief is an active rejection of God's promise. Faith does not become a condition with that. It is not that we must fulfill a condition before God will give it to us. No, God gives it to us and we receive it by faith. Faith is the means by which we receive it. Faith that are the hands which receive what God gives to us. Faith is then even not our own work. It is the Holy Spirit who works in us. The Holy Spirit who tears down the walls of resistance, which are our natural inclination to hate God and our neighbor. The Holy Spirit breaks down those walls of resistance, and now we believe it and we receive it. Brothers and sisters, if you receive something enormous, if you know you're going to die, and all of a sudden something changes in your life, and someone comes and, and tells you you're going to live, and he does what is needed to give you life, then you are not going to boast in yourself that you believed this person who did everything for you, and therefore you are so good, and therefore you received it. No, you are thankful, and you express your thankfulness to the person who saved you from death. And if you receive such an enormous thing as a righteousness by faith, faith, righteousness by faith that is given to us by God, we only need to receive it. Then you're not going to say, well, it is my act of faith by which I receive it. It is my deed of obedience to God by which I receive it, and therefore, by my work, I am righteous. No, that is not what you're going to say. You're going to say, praised be to God who gave it to me. But even if you would be inclined to boast in your own faith, then the Bible even teaches us, know that faith even is given to you by God. Philippians 2, it is God who works in, in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works in us, not ourselves. And that it takes all boasting away, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. And therefore, brothers and sisters, entrust yourself to Christ as your Redeemer. Grab hold of him. Don't think that you have to do anything. No, you can go to Christ, grab his hand and let him save you. He can save you from eternal death and he only. And then not the quality of your faith is important. And if you go to a Christian bookstore, no, not our own bookstore, but, but other Christian bookstores, then you will find all kinds of books there, 40 days to a better life with God or seven days to a better prayer life that kind of books, as if it depends on the quality of your faith. No, that's nonsense. It is about childlike faith. That is what it's all about in our life, and that is what we have to learn every day of our lives, to humble ourselves and to become like a child, to get rid of all our pride and all our boasting, and just focus on God, on His Word, Humble ourselves in sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. He will exalt you. God will do it, not you. That is faith. Childlike faith. Become like a child. It goes against all human wisdom. All human wisdom is that we have to grow, that we have to get stronger, that we get no more knowledge, that we get more skills. But God says, no, humble yourself. And God is teaching us and God is testing us and God is preparing us for our eternal life with him here on this earth. Whatever happens on this earth. And there are things we don't understand. And there are things that, that make us sad. Things that happen that God allows to happen and we don't understand. But God is testing us. God is preparing us also in those situations to trust in him. Don't look at ourselves. Don't think, what did I do wrong? But look at Christ. Christ who came to die for our sins. That is what God wants. Depend on him. Trust in him. With childlike trust. Believing that whatever God does is good. 
And that makes us righteous before God. And that is important. That we are righteous before God. God loves us. God gave his son to make us righteous. Because it is his desire to live with us in eternal blessedness. And therefore we don't trust any human judgment. But we trust God's judgment. God's judgment is wiser than the wisest judgment of human beings. And that only is important. What God says is important. If God declares us righteous, let all those people speak. Let all those people talk who look down on us Christians. Don't listen to them. It's all about God and his word. God declares us righteous. It is Satan who tries to sow doubt. Satan who raises all those questions in our hearts so that we would give in to those questions and, and, and think, well, maybe it's not true. He uses our conscience to set it up against us. Either to make us think lightly about sin, oh, well, my sins, I live a pretty good life. Or he makes us think very heavily about our sin so that we are afraid to come before God. And we see both things happening among, among Christians. Some become very superficial, other they, they get bogged down in their sins and, and they constantly talk about themselves as a sinner. I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm, I'm a worm, I'm not a man. They love to say, and in the meantime, they forget to give praise to Jesus Christ. But that is not what God teaches us. That is what Satan teaches us. We know from God's word there is forgiveness for all those who repent and ask for forgiveness. God will never disappoint. If you go to God and ask for forgiveness, God will give you forgiveness. If you ask God from the heart to forgive you all your sins, you will gladly do so and you may rejoice. Because that is what God wants. He wants you to live a life in joy and thankfulness. To go through life rejoicing. Even though Satan may threaten you, even so though the world may threaten you, even though things may happen in, happen in your life that takes away, that may take away for a while the joy. But God wants you also in those circumstances that you are being tested by adversity, sickness, or even death. God wants his child to rejoice in him. To lift up your head above what you can see. And look on Jesus Christ. Rejoice in him. And celebrate your life with God. The beginning of it on this earth. And it will come to completion on a new heaven and a new earth. That is what God promises us. He does not want us to perish. He does not want us to succumb under our fears. He does not want us to live in grief and sorrow. He wants us to rejoice always. If you read the letter of Paul to the Philippians, it's constantly about rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice. God declares it to us in the Bible. We are righteous. Rejoice in it. God assures us of, of it in the sacraments. Again, next week the Lord's Supper. Rejoice. Celebrate. Believe it. Trust in God. And that will make your life beautiful now and always in sickness and health, in adversity and prosperity, in whatever circumstances. We may rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us now sing in response to the word of God from Psalm 27, the verses 3 and 6.
brothers and sisters, let us not pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you, Holy Throne. You are the God who declares us righteous. You are the God who loves us. The God who gives life and takes life. <clears throat> the Lord, our God, the God of the covenant who comes to us in your love, who showed your love in the sending of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to suffer and to die for our sins, so that we are righteous before you. And Father, we thank you that we may receive that righteousness by faith, that we may know that by faith in Jesus Christ we may stand before you without sin, completely righteous. We may live with you. That you may have the beginning of the eternal blessedness here and now in this life on this earth. And that we know that nothing shall separate us from your love, not even death. And that we may know that we may live with you eternally. And we may look forward to the great day that you make all things new. Father, we pray this afternoon, especially for Gerald and Elsa Zurich. They also are grieving because of what happened in their life. Gerald's brother and niece. Father, we strengthen them. We comfort them. We comfort all those who are grieving, that they all may find their comfort in you, knowing that even death is not able to pluck us out of your hand. Father, we thank you that we may have that beautiful gospel, that we may lift up our hands now with rejoicing above all the hostile forces, also the forces of death, death being a last enemy. But we know that also death is defeated by our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we may know that all those who believe in him will live, even though they may die. Father, give us then that we continue in that certainty, that we embrace that promise in our lives, and that that may give us joy, and that despite all that is happening in our lives, we may rejoice in our life with you. Father, may you then be with us this week. Guide us in everything through your word and your Holy Spirit, that we do not fear what this world fears, that we are not afraid for all that human powers can do, that we are not afraid for all the disasters on this world, whether it is caused by human powers, by, by countries, by powerful countries, or it is caused by natural disasters, or pandemics, or sickness, or whatever happens on this earth. We know that it all is part of your work. And in it all and through it all, you work to the great day that you will come and that your Son will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And we thank you that we do not need to fear judgment day because we are righteous before you. Father, give us then that our life on this earth we live in righteousness and live in joy and thankfulness before you. Glorify your name in our lives. Use us so that your word may sound all over the earth, may be proclaimed all over the world, that many may hear it, that many may come to faith and receive salvation, that all over this world your church may be built and your kingdom may come. Father, we thank you that we could receive this day of rest, that we could enjoy being together in the church services and being strengthened in our faith, not with a worldly joy, but with a joy that is worked in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Father, receive our thanks and hear our prayer in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you may now give your sacrifices of thankfulness to the Lord. Your offerings are for the work in Cairns. Let us then sing thereafter from Psalm 32, the verses 4 and 5.
Brothers and sisters, now receive the blessing of the Lord and depart in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.